Now, something that's been lost to history is a little bit about Disney's Animal Kingdom. When the Animal Kingdom first opened, it was supposed to have three specific parts. It was supposed to have live animals, it was supposed to have dinosaurs, and it was supposed to have mythical creatures or dragons. The, you can still see the dinosaurs and the live animals here, but the dragons kind of got lost to history. There was an intent to build something called the Beastly Kingdom here and have dragons on display and do some interesting things, but it never came to pass. But you can still see the history of what they had in mind in some of the signage and artwork and decorations around the park. So we'll take a look at those and talk about what it was in history. Walt Disney loved animals. He created a series called The True Life Adventures where he sent film crews into the wild to actually film animals in their natural habitats and then he would broadcast that on The Wonderful World of Disney. Now it turns out that the story of lemmings jumping off a cliff was produced by the directors of the show because they realized that the lemmings weren't very interesting, but nevertheless, the idea was certainly born and they had this great idea for presenting nature to you. When Walt Disney opened the Disneyland Park in the 1950s, he wanted to have actual animal encounters and had this idea for the Jungle Cruise where he would have live animals roaming around and you would come up close to them in a boat. Of course, this idea proved impractical and wasn't able to go forward, so they replaced them with audio animatronic versions. But no good idea ever dies at Disney. Enter Michael Eisner in the 1980s. Michael Eisner had all these ideas and ambitions to create a media empire and really grow the Disney company in many ways. It was a period of unbridled growth where he created new hotels, new experiences, new theme parks, new attractions, all kinds of things. And so he was looking for pitches from different people and the Imagineers had an idea that Walt Disney had originally thought of and that was having a live animal park. So they presented it to Michael Eisner and Frank Wells. The idea was simple. They wanted to have three themed areas. The first was a safari with existing wild animals. The second was real animals that you can't see today but were actually real animals that existed in the past. And the third was an area related to mythical creatures. That would be mythical or dragon or anything else the like. So they pitched this idea a couple of times, but it took a third try for Joe Rohde and the team to actually get Michael Eisner and Frank Wells to buy into it. And the way they did that was to bring in a Bengal tiger to actually meet these higher ups in the company. And honestly, they were stopped in their tracks. They were so fascinated by the animal that they decided this was the way to go and they went forward with the project. And so here we come to 1995 when the announcement is made. In a special press conference held recently at Walt Disney World, Disney chairman Michael Eisner unveiled plans for the biggest and most ambitious theme park in Disney history. I'm here to announce that we're going to present a wild animal kingdom on 500 acres just west of our north-south road. Five times the size of the Magic Kingdom and the largest of all Disney theme parks in the world, Disney's Wild Animal Kingdom will be the first live-action adventure park of its kind. Filled with the natural drama of today's wildlife, it will celebrate animals from real life, fantasy, and fables. That it is going to combine the real world of animals with the extinct world of animals and with animals from mythology uh, as well. The first thing that happens to you when you enter the park is you're plunged into this fantastic jungle environment. Uh, there's river journeys, boat journeys you take that take you from fantasy realms to prehistoric realms. Now building the Africa part where you have the live animals, that part was relatively easy. You bring in the animals and you decide to create something around it, like an attraction like Kilimanjaro Safaris where you can take people out to actually encounter the animals in the wild. Pretty straightforward in that sense. Do a hippo hurricane holler. <laughs> I asked for a hippo hurricane holler, buddy. I get one, don't I? Dino Land was actually pretty easy as well. You're creating a themed area where you're talking about paleontology or things that existed in the past. Pretty straightforward in that sense, and because of the relationship Disney had already built with the Field Museum and McDonald's to take Sue and actually start taking the bones in and doing your cleanup on them, it made sense to go ahead with the dinosaur-themed exhibit. So that was pretty straightforward. The harder part was creating this third theme part, this area where you would have mythological creatures, other things that didn't exist. They had the land all set aside. You can see it circled here, and the arrow points to the entrance to the animal kingdom. 
but they really didn't have a whole lot of time or money to be able to invest in this. Now, as you can see, they really had drawn out something really spectacular. There were a lot of drawings that were done about the theme park, but the Beastly Kingdom, as it became known, was still on hold for a period of time. Now let's talk about what the Beastly Kingdom looked like. The idea was you would cross over a troll bridge and you would head into the kingdom that way. And that bridge was actually constructed and that's where you led into Camp Mini Mickey and currently go into Pandora. It has the troll theming to it. They just didn't quite finish it off with an actual troll or some model of a troll along the way. You had a boat that was going to go around through the area and uh, that was what uh, Joe Rody was talking about. And then you had the good area where you would talk about mythological creatures and you would encounter them in some way. So there would be a couple of attractions here. The first would be a hedge maze that you would go through. And when you reach the end of the hedge maze, the payoff would be that you would see a unicorn that was an audio animatronic unicorn. Clever idea that never really came to be. The other area was a boat ride that went through a mythological space. And what they would show there were things like Fantasia it had drawn out. So you might have dancing elephants or dancing hippopotamuses or something like that that would be mythological in nature. And then there was also a kraken that was in the water. And the kraken was a cool idea that would be this interactive mythological creature that you would come to at various times, especially if you were on a boat ride on the outside, you would run into it. Then there was a bridge that went across and that bridge would be this foreboding bridge that would head to a giant castle. And this is where the evil side was, the bad side, where the dragons were. So in this castle, they had come up with this entire theme and a storyline to create an e-ticket attraction. This would be something really spectacular. They had come up with an entire theme for the attraction, and the attraction was going to be a dragon who was protecting gold. And there were going to be bats who were stealing the gold, and you would be inside the bat suspended on a hanging roller coaster that was going around trying to get the gold out of the dragon's lair while he's breathing fire on you. What a clever idea. It was so cool in its thematics, I'm surprised it never came to be. So the idea was firmly set for phase two of Disney's Animal Kingdom. And they actually started some construction, you can see like this, this building here, that was part of what they had in mind for it. And when they first produced the park maps, just before park opening, they had the Beastly Kingdom still on there. So this was clearly part of something they wanted to do. And if you listen to Michael Eisner at the dedication speech, you know more. Good morning. When Walt Disney first dreamed up what was to become Disneyland, he was imagining something unprecedented, a completely new form of entertainment where he could tell three-dimensional stories. Six Disney theme parks have opened, including the Magic Kingdom, Epcot Center, Disney MGM Studios here in Florida, each an original entertainment concept. When we started conjuring up a fourth theme park at Walt Disney World, we knew we had to come up with something that set itself apart, something that was novel and distinct. We considered a number of ideas but the theme that kept topping the list was the world of animals. The more we explored the idea, the more we became aware that nature is perhaps the greatest storyteller of all. From the smallest ant to the biggest bull elephant, the true life adventures of animals are fascinating and ever-changing. Indeed, that is the one aspect that sets the animal kingdom apart. Here, an unpredictability will take center stage. On the Kilimanjaro Safari, our animal cast members do not follow a script. Every trip will be a different adventure. Every journey will bring a different story. The day has finally arrived to dedicate Disney's Animal Kingdom, an epic that has been literally making and taking millions of years to accomplish. As is the Disney tradition, we have posted a dedication plaque at the entrance. In a few words, it captures our ambition in creating the park. It reads, welcome to the kingdom of animals, real, ancient, and imagined. A kingdom ruled by lions, dinosaurs, and dragons a kingdom of balance, harmony, and survival. A kingdom we enter to share in the wonder, 
gaze at the beauty, thrill at the drama, and learn. Disney's Animal Kingdom is almost ready, but the fact is it needs two more elements in order to come fully to life. Our human cast members and of course our guests. But if you still weren't sure that it was going to be coming, all you had to do was watch what they were doing in Central Park around the same time that park opening was happening. They did this elaborate display of people representing the three lands that were part of the animal kingdom. So you had a dragon, and then you had people that were uh, made up in a lion, and then you had some people that made up uh, a Tyrannosaurus Rex. So those three different areas were represented well in that space that they had created in Central Park. And it was just kind of a cool idea, and it showed what they had in mind. Disney was on track for phase two, coming soon to an animal kingdom near you. But when it did open, Disney decided to just lightly theme the area and call it Camp Mini Mickey. They had some greeting trails where you could be Mickey and friends, and you could go to the Lion King show. So if we take what Joe Rohde said and the actual park map, we see that there was supposed to be a boat ride that went through the entirety of the Animal Kingdom and went around and took you through different things. And part of the plan was to give you this preview of what the Beastly Kingdom was going to look like. In fact, if you look at the lower left-hand corner of this map, it says Scene 3, Dragon's Lair. I mentioned the Kraken before, and the Kraken was important because they had this idea for in the boat ride for you to encounter the Kraken and they would do some fun things in the boat, but that never made it past cast preview and didn't make it into the final cut of the attraction. There was also supposed to be a unicorn, hearkening back to the idea of the maze, and then what they did is they put it up on a pedestal and were putting smoke on it and would shine a light on it so that it would look like it was moving somehow, but that didn't make it past the first month or two of the park being open. So for most of the life of the attraction, it was open for about 15 months before finally closing, they just took you on a boat tour where they would show you live animals that were smaller animals that they could bring on the boat and, and demonstrate. The boat ride lasted 22 minutes, but they really didn't talk about anything that was out there. And it was kind of sad because there were some cool things, like you just saw the building there. And there was this cool idea of a waterfall that was shaped like a dragon, but they didn't really talk about it for most of the attraction's lifespan. It's kind of a shame because this was actually one of those cool things that was still open until the world of Pandora opened. Now you can still see it in the underbrush, but it no longer has the water coming out of its mouth. That's good. So I brought something else with me, and this is a uh, Costa Rican zebrini tarantula. Now, I mentioned that there was supposed to be a dragon's lair, so there was this idea to create a fire-breathing dragon that would live inside this cave, and for the first couple of months the park was open, this actually existed. And here's a video I found of that. Now, this, uh, this little outcropping of rocks over here, we call this dragon rocks, because there's something very peculiar about the rocks, and you may soon find out. Oh, but the story was much more interesting. Originally, they had the idea of creating a storyline, a backstory, where there would be a series of knights that were trying to slay the dragon, but it were 
cast off themselves, and there's just pieces of armor that are laying around near the dragon's lair. So it was an elaborate story they had created, and in fact, there was a lot of detail, including this guy who was up on a spit high up with the talon marks in him, and he's burned by the dragon's fire. Really incredible, and unfortunately, it was deemed too intense for children, and they removed that after about a month of the park being open. So there isn't much to talk about there, but that's the way they came up with this idea. And it lasted for about 15 months. The ride itself was kind of boring. There wasn't much to see. And by the time the 15 months were up, the idea for the beastly kingdom had already died. So there was no point in continuing on the boat ride. Of course, there are still homages to the dragon around the park, including the park signage where you see him in the middle. There are some lamp posts where you see the outline of it on the lamp itself. This is out in front. On some park benches, you still see the dragon there. And the mythological creatures, likewise, are still represented in the bas relief at the entrance. You can see a pegasus near the M and a griffin near the A in Animal. It's really pretty cool that they had this idea and there's still an homage to it there. And of course, there was the unicorn section of the parking lot that I believe has changed names recently or is undergoing a name change, so it may not stay unicorn forever. Now, as far as homages to the dragon itself and the land that they had planned to create, there is an elaborate carved dragon that's in the bas relief up on the left-hand side. He was over on my right shoulder when I was doing the intro. And he goes along with the elephant and the dinosaur that they have at the entrance. And that is the story of dragons at Disney's Animal Kingdom. Mm -hmm.